welcome to Conversations with Consequences. We're the ladies of the Catholic Association, bringing you witty and charming in-depth conversation on the topics that matter to you with the leading thinkers and movers of our time. A special hello to all of our new listeners as we now are part of the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network and working in partnership with the Guadalupe Radio Network. I'm your hostess, Dr. Gracie Christie, and I'm joined in studio by my dear friend, Andrea picciotti Bayer, also of the Catholic Association. We also have a voice familiar to many of you, Dr. Greg Popchek, who joins us from More to Life, airing weekly on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. I'm really interested in talking with Dr. Popchak personally, uh, because for me, what I experience is very often because I'm a medical professional and because people know that I'm a faithful Catholic, I go to church every day, people come up to me all the time. I, I would say probably once a week. People come up to me all the time and they say, where can I get a psychologist or a counselor? Where can I meet? Uh, where can I find someone like that who will also take into very serious um, consideration the fact that I am a serious Catholic, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a person whose religion is very important, I'm a person that understands my duty as a human being, my responsibilities to others, the fact that I have vows that I've, I've, I've made and that I want to keep, I'm talking now about marriage of course, and finding the right person, the right counselor can be a daunting prospect. With new reports on mental illness being on the rise, we're going to discuss some of the contributing factors with Dr. Papchek. And with all of his years of experience as a counselor, what's our response as Catholics? But first, <laughs> I have the privilege of introducing to our listeners another well-known doctor on EWTN, my dear friend and co-hostess today, Dr. Gracie Christie. Um, Gracie, in addition to being a fabulous, fabulous Catholic voice in the public square, <laughs> really fabulous, I really love you, um, you're a practicing doctor and a committed mother of five with great kids and a loving wife to a really fine man, but I'd like to hear a little bit more about what does your day job as a doctor look like? So I'm a diagnostic radiologist. And so what I do is different places send me images to interpret. I work from home, which I started doing about, uh, let me think, it'll be 19 years ago that I started working from home. When I used you were to work five. in a hospital. When you were five years old. <laughs> I used to work in a hospital. Child product. And then I had my third child, and I had a nervous breakdown. And then <laughs> I needed this Dr. Popchak. This episode's going to be wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> I needed Dr. Popchak at that time. Well, yeah, I did have like a little mental moment where I said to myself, I can't keep going. I, I think had we three all little have children those at moments. home. Yeah. Usually and it comes I, at the third. Yeah, it happens after number three. So then I started working from home, and I do that every day. I'm, I guess I'm a, a full time radiologist and a part time radio show hostess. <laughs> <laughs> with you, Andrea. What, what I really love, um, and because I've joined following you with thousands of other Americans on Twitter, um, is that you often look at ultrasounds of, of women that are expecting babies. And you've posted different stages of development. And I think it's a very good message. Uh, and last year, around this time, you gave a wonderful spe uh, speech uh, in anticipation for the March for Life about the role of your work in medicine and the area that you work in and how that's going to help continue to be a game changer. So I do a lot of different kinds of radiology, but every day I do a little, at least some fetal ultrasound. So I do prenatal ultrasounds. And really that's a big part of what animates me in my work outside of radiology, because through fetal ultrasound, I came to have a very strong, I identify very strongly with those littlest of my patients. I find that they are as important as their mothers and fathers. Their, their, their lives have dignity and meaning, even if they're very, very small, even if they're at the mercy of the more powerful people around them. And that does animate me in, my, in, my, in the rest of my work. And I did talk one time, I, I, was a, I was one of the main speakers at the March for Life. That was a big, a big honor for me in DC, and that was, I think, three or four years ago. And I did talk about prenatal ultrasound and how Unfortunately, sometimes my work leads to a prenatal diagnosis of some disability of the child. And then, you know, I, I worry. I worry for the child that in our society where we tend to, um, unfortunately, abort children who are disabled and we detect their disability, that I worry that these littlest of my patients will be rejected. 
So that's uh, something that I think is a, it's a great shame in a society that wants to call itself equal, that pe- all people are created equal. So for me, when I, when, when I hear talk about does the fetus feel pain in the womb, I'm approaching the question from the perspective of any doctor who thinks about their patient and wonders what a therapy uh, will feel like to the patient, how the patient is going to experience um, any kind of therapy, any kind of intervention that is planned for that patient. When we're talking about abortion, of course, we are talking about uh, not a therapy, not a, um, a health intervention. We're talking about the purposeful ending of a fetal life. For me, as the doctor of that fetal patient, of that very young human, it seems very natural to consider not only the the horror of ending a human life simply for being inconvenient, which is this is the vast majority of, of abortions are done for convenience reasons, but also how does it feel to be uh, ripped limb from limb? <laughs> that's, a, that's a strong way to say it, but for me as the doctor of these fetal patients, I have to think about it that way. The latest science shows that Uh, babies do feel pain in the womb much sooner than we thought because the way that these things are approached is through understanding the neuronal pathways that are being formed in the fetal brains during the weeks of development. And um, in the in some time ago, it was thought that fetal pain uh, didn't start to occur. The baby didn't know that he was being hurt. Uh, until much later in the pregnancy. But now that number is coming down because we understand better the development of the fetal brain. So the, really, from my perspective, it can be nothing more important than, than first protecting the life of this individual human being. And secondly, considering very strongly from an ethical perspective and a moral perspective that we are causing a tremendous amount of pain when we kill a child in utero a baby after a certain stage of development. When that stage of development is, that's a very important point. And minimizing it and talking about, well, you know, probably they don't feel pain. Really? Imagine if um, we were considering rending puppies limb from limb. It would be very important, right, to know how these puppies felt about it. And I, and I bet that a lot of people that are okay with abortion would not be okay with destroying puppies without first anesthetizing them. Well, what I most enjoy about your area of medicine as as a mom is the experience and the connection that I had when expecting a child and and how the ultrasound really, you know, you know that something's going on and then you get to see this beautiful child uh, developing and it really kind of helps gel the awesomeness and the miracle behind life and it's mm-hmm. it's a wonderful window I mean I think that our generation is incredibly blessed and, and I saw recently I think you showed me pictures of the MRIs of um, women expecting and the babies and how even more vivid well MRIs <laughs> of, of fetuses are very rare but when we do get to see them they are absolutely fabulous because they do give you tiny detail of these very intricate lovely little creatures that are growing inside their moms and it's really, it, it, it really connects us to the beginnings of all people and the dignity of all people. Now we have the pleasure of welcoming Dr. Greg Popchek to Conversations with Consequences. Good afternoon, Greg. Hello. Good to be here. Thank you for joining us. Oh, this is a very, my pleasure. We're really excited to talk to you, uh, to have a conversation with you about mental illness, <laughs> which is sort of a dark topic. But uh, I think a lot of our brothers and sisters, a lot of us, are walking around um, uh, worried well. I, like, I think of us as the worried well, many of us, uh, who, would, who, would, who would say we don't have mental illness, but we, many of us are struggling with anxiety and depression, and if not us, then someone we love in our families. And I think uh, you would agree, Dr. Greg, that we have um, too many people uh, in the United States suffering in these ways. Is that true? Oh, there's no question. I mean, it certainly the, the term mental illness sounds particularly onerous and scary, mm-hmm. um, but, the, but, but the reality is um, one in five visits to a primary care physician have to do with anxiety disorders. Mm-hmm. Another, another, uh, another 20% have to do with depressive disorders. 
Um, so uh, mental and emotional health problems are significant. And uh, although certainly as Christians we receive grace to live life more abundantly, that doesn't mean that we still aren't affected by the brokenness and sinfulness of the world and that we uh, don't still need healing of our emotions and our relational, uh, relational life as well as our, our, our psychological health. Dr. Greg, this is Andrea. I'm a lawyer, and um, I'm very behind on my continuing legal education, so I've been binge-watching videos <laughs> to get all my legal credits in uh, with the California Bar Association, and there are a lot of videos about um, mental illness and anxiety and depression in the legal profession, and I've been learning a lot about that to both understand and help do my own reflection um, and assessments, but think about the colleagues that I work with. And a lot of the stories are ones that I think probably apply to all adults and aren't, aren't just unique to lawyers, um, although we are a special group of people. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> I love it. It's arg. Wait for laugh. <laughs> no, <and laughs> Dr. Popchak refrains from commenting on laugh. So yeah. <laughs> on the legal profession. But um, perhaps it, you've written a lot about factors that contribute to mental health uh, challenges and stresses in a, in a person's life. Could you give us an overview of what are the kinds of factors that kind of set us up for facing these difficulties, whether they are uh, factors in our family of origin or in the circumstances that we're living in? You know, it's funny. Um, it, our, our mental health tends to depend less on what happens to us. That's not to say that what happens to us isn't important, but it tends to depend less on what happens to us than the strength of our relationships and our ability to respond in healthy ways to the stuff that happens to us. Um, and so when we experience rela uh, relationship trauma, so when the people who love us treat us poorly, uh, abuse us, um, or when, our, when we experience disconnect in our relationships that is frustrating for us, um, uh, or when we um, experience things that cause us to, how do I put it, respond, uh, well, in, in, in kind of destructive ways. Um, that's what undermines our, our mental health. You know, so, you know, two people can go through the same bad experience. For one person, it can be an opportunity for growth. For another person, it could actually undermine their well-being. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that has to do with the strength uh, of their healthy connections with others and their ability to respond rather than react to their environment. Hmm. What about religiosity, Dr. Gregg? How does that protect us from mental well, that, illness? Sure, well that, that's a big part of actually the connected piece of that equation I was just describing. Um, in almost every study, uh, religiosity, r religious involvement is um, a, a positive factor for both staving off uh, mental and emotional problems uh, and helping us bounce back quicker from them when we do fall into depression or anxiety or other emotional or relational problems. Um, now, of course, there's the grace component in that, which we can't measure with social mm -hmm. sciences. Um, but on a human level, uh, there's a lot of data to suggest that, that religious involvement does several things for us. First of all, it gives us a vision of how we're supposed to be, so it helps us keep our bearings. You know, when something bad happens to us, it's very easy to just get lost in the pain of the moment and feel mm -hmm. like this is all there is and this is all I was meant for. And so we just start living a smaller and smaller life until we feel suffocated by it. But as Christians um, and people of faith in general, we are constantly reminded that there's more to life, that, um, that we're called to be more and to grow uh, into something more than what we see when we look at the mirror. And so it helps us to regain our balance and our bearings after we've experienced something difficult, and it helps us get back up on our feet. Um, another thing that religious involvement really does is it creates communities of support. Um, we have a tendency to isolate, you know, when we go through difficult times. We don't want to be a burden to others. We're embarrassed or ashamed, and so we kind of hide out. Uh, but when we're involved in, in a religious community, of some sort, or parish, uh, you know, prayer meetings, that sort of things, um, people notice that we're not there. 
you know, and and they reach out to us and they come and find us and they offer support and and uh, and, and and come around us, encouraging us to get back on our feet and and join the, the community even if we don't feel like it. And that's a big protective factor uh, in, uh, in 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 mental health. So so again, and then of course that connection with God. Um, allowing us to feel like we are loved, even when we're alone, even when we're disconnected from others, that, that there is someone who is walking with us and going through things with us and calling us through it is, is tremendously beneficial as well. Earlier today, um, I was in, in Mass this morning, and, and the priest said something that I thought really clicked, and it was one of those, oh, the Holy Spirit's preparing me for this conversation. And he said, the Lord doesn't just forgive he also heals and and applying what i think was is a very supernatural um understanding of our relationship with god to the the context of mental health stressors or even mental illness um the the role of god not just religiosity and not just our faith community but like you mentioned the role of grace is is a big factor and it's not something you hear a lot of people in your profession, not as far as pastoral counsels, but um, in, in right, psychotherapy in and stuff. In general, yeah. What makes what you do different? How do you incorporate kind of the supernatural, the relationship that we have with God into your therapy and, and yeah. especially in, in the counselors that you're working with so that they can tap into that grace yeah. that's kind of the, the vitamin to get through this tough time? So uh, people a lot of times are confused at what a pastoral counselor is, uh, and you know because historically pastoral counseling was just the counseling that pastors did. Um, it, it's become its own profession, and so pastoral counselors, which is what I am, um, have a have their basic training and a, and, a, and a license to practice mental health therapy. Um, you know, in, in you know either psychology or social work or counseling, but on top of that they've received additional training in theology and spirituality that allows them to integrate uh, faith and spirituality into the clinical sessions. So there are, there are healthy ways to do that and ethical ways to do that and effective ways to do that, and pastoral counselors have gotten the training uh, in order to be able to, to offer uh, both the mental health and spiritual integration uh, in that effective and ethical way. So a lot of what we do through my practice, uh, and this is true not just for me, but all the counselors, the 11 therapists that work with me full-time through the Pastoral Solutions Institute at catholiccounselors.com, um, all of us uh, integrate Catholic faith and spirituality into the actual session. So, of course, we pray for our clients both outside and inside of session. Hmm. But in addition to that, um, That's lovely. <laughs> we'll That's also really talk lovely. with them about, um, so for example, if we do cognitive therapy with them and we talk about the different thoughts that we have that pass through our heads that can sometimes be destructive or unhealthy, we'll talk about cognitive distortions, which are those unhealthy thinking habits. At the same time, we talk about uh, Ignatian principles of, of discernment of spirits so that we can kind of also get a sense of what is the spiritual battle that's going on there in our minds as these thoughts are passing through our head. Um, when we Doctor, talk about behavior therapy. Yeah, I'm sorry. I could interrupt for a second. It's yeah. now 15 minutes past the hour. You're listening to Conversations with Consequences. We are joined by Dr. Greg Popchick discussing the true realities of mental illness. Sorry to interrupt, Dr. Greg. Go ahead. Keep going. Tell no, us no, about... No, no. Giving different examples of, of how we integrate uh, the Catholic faith and spirituality into our practice at, at CatholicCounselors.com. And, you know, so I was talking about cognitive therapy, which is sort of the, the gold standard for, for dealing with depression and anxiety and those sorts of things. Um, but but uh, behavior therapy, you know, so is when you're focusing on changing behavior, we also integrate a discussion about virtue. You know, what, mm -hmm. if we had this virtue, how would we respond differently? Where else have we displayed those kinds of virtues, and how has it enabled us to respond in a more proactive and effective way? How could we adapt those responses to this situation? So, you know, it's that integration of, of prayer, uh, Catholic spirituality, uh, practices of, of spiritual discernment, and that sort of virtue-based mindset that, that I think distinguishes us um, in many ways from, from what you might expect from a normal counselor. That's abs that sounds absolutely brilliant, Dr. Pacek. Pacek. And, I, and I think that you're probably, I know you're feeling a very uh, deep need in, in the community of, of religious believers, of Catholics, 
who find themselves with, uh, whether it's anxiety or depression or, or worse, mental illness, with nowhere to turn because it's, it's been my experience that clinical psychologists tend to be very secular in their mindset and they have not, not just um, an inability to integrate, like you do, spiritual components into therapy, but even of a complete lack of understanding of the mindset and worldview of a person who has a spiritual life as well as um, a material life. Yeah, I think that's true, and I think it, you know it's it's important to to the degree that it's possible to find a therapist that that um, it ideally can integrate your faith and values into your counseling, or at the very least is supportive uh, of your faith and values, um, because you know therapy is all about not just making behavioral change, but but changes in attitude and changes in belief, um, and very often a secular therapist can. Uh, challenge your religious faith in a way that uh, that isn't helpful. Mm-hmm. You know, so working with somebody who who understands and is able to integrate your faith and spirituality into practice, or, or at the very least, is is supportive of it, um, is really very important. Dr. Greg, I know Gracie and I both um, appreciate in our own lives and in the lives of our family the importance of our faith, of our Catholic faith, and our Catholic community in helping deal with the the difficulties that each one of us is facing. But I want to kind of look at it from a, another, th- the flip side. Sometimes religious people and religious communities are very closed off into recognizing when there are problems for, for a range of issues, either shame or concern or not wanting to air your dirty laundry. What are the challenges in, in your reaching out to people, whether it's through More to Life or in Catholic counselors, to let people know it's okay to get help and to also be able to understand when things aren't working well, either in their homes or in their families or even within themselves. You know, it, it, having emotional or relational problems doesn't mean that you're a bad Christian. It doesn't mean that God doesn't love you. It doesn't mean that you've somehow messed up and that God isn't giving you his grace. It, it, it means that, that God wants to heal you. It means that uh, you've been affected, like we all have, by the brokenness of the world, and th- th- by participating in a life of grace, you know that you're worth more. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know that when God looks at you, he doesn't see the broken, messy thing that you see when you look in the mirror, and that he wants to make more out of you. He wants to make more out of your life. And, and you know, it's St. Paul who says that it's in our weakness that God is glorified. Uh, I, I find that, that by acknowledging those broken parts of ourselves, that we are able to glorify God even more um, by watching the wondrous things that he can do in us and with us and through us. So, you know, the, the, that would be the biggest challenge I think we run into a lot is that people are afraid to get help because they feel like, you know, if they could just pray better or if they could just mm-hmm. believe more or trust in God more faithfully, um, that they wouldn't have these problems. And that's really not true at all. Sin affects us all. Brokenness affects us all. Uh, and when I say sin, I don't even necessarily mean your personal sin. I mean the sin of the world mm-hmm. flashes up on us. Other people's sins affect us. They, they commit sins and traumas against us. And God wants to heal us of all of that. So it's not your fault that, that something isn't working right. Uh, it's an opportunity to receive God's grace and glorify Him through the weakness that we all experience in our lives. You told us that you have a group of 11 other uh, counselors that work with you, Dr. Greg? That's right, yes. Mm-hmm. And how do your patients find you? Uh, well, we are online at catholiccounselors.com, and people can learn more about the practice there. Uh, and, and all of our therapists uh, are licensed mental health professionals. They all have additional training in the kind of pastoral counseling techniques I was just talking about. Um, I, I supervise them all personally, and we meet regularly to discuss cases and do ongoing formation. We, we have clients all over the world, actually, across North America. I, I know we have clients in South Africa, in Hong Kong, uh, in the U.K., uh, Australia, off the top of I my head. I think you have uh, you have 10 or 15 prospective clients right here in Miami, Father. <laughs> Dr. Greg, in the, in the Christie household. No, in eh? the Christie household. <laughs> no, but that's a really um, taking advantage of technology and to be able, for a lot of people, especially if they're dealing with crisis, getting to a doctor's office. And especially in the context of, of abuse and everything else, can be a very dangerous venture. And well, having and I, an opportunity. And I have to say, you know, when we first started doing this in 1999, no one else, no one else was doing it, and everybody kind of looked at us a little officially, like, you know, oh, telecounseling. What is that all about? Um, it's really become mainstream at this point, mm-hmm. and uh, there are dozens of studies now 
In fact, the APA, the American Psychological Association, just came out with a huge study endorsing tele- what they call behavioral telehealth um, as being as effective as face-to-face, and in some cases even more effective uh, because uh, well, what, what we found, for example, is that people open up more readily um, via mm-hmm. either telephone or teleconference. They keep their appointments more consistently because it's just easier to access sessions. Um, and they feel and more insurance. comfortable. Insurance pays yeah. for it, right? Yeah, well, yes, you can. We, uh, we don't accept insurance directly. What happens is clients will pay us up front, and then we provide uh, statements that they can turn in for their insurance. Although we do find that a majority of our clients do get something back from their insurance. So that, that's been a very a good thing as well. So that's amazing that you see patients from all over the world. What a wonderful thing. And, and, and I do feel very strongly that, you're, that there's a great need for counselors like you who do integrate the spiritual with the material. Thank you. And, and uh, I should say we offer uh, services in English and Spanish as well. Oh, more clients um, in Miami. <laughs> <laughs> Doctor, um, among your clients, are, are you dealing with young people as well? And I hope that in our second segment we can talk, both Gracie and I are moms of many, and we'd like to talk about some of the challenges facing young people. But it, is that a, a service that you're offering to young people, or are you predominantly dealing with adults? No, it's, 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 uh, we're actually a full-service practice. Anything you'd expect to get from your, your standard kind of face-to-face private practice, we do. So we do marriage counseling, we do family counseling, um, and individuals as well. We, when we work with kids, what we try to do, uh, or what we prefer to do, is really help parents be their kids' primary support. Um, we don't, you know, we don't believe uh, that it's our place to stand between parents and their children. We, we would much rather help parents be the, the, the source of healing for their kids. So we will work with kids and their parents to help them uh, figure out how to respond to the challenges that they're facing together. Dr. Pacek, in the next segment, we're going to, we're going to talk to you some more about uh, adults and children and Catholic counseling and how you're helping all next right here on EWTN Radio. back to Conversations with Consequences on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. We're broadcasting from the Guadalupe Radio Network studios here in Washington, D.C. We've been speaking to EWTN's More to Life's Dr. Greg Popchak this hour. I'm Dr. Gracie Christie, and I am with my colleague, Andrea picciotti Bear. Dr. Popchak, in preparing for our conversation with you, I asked friends for, hey, what do you want to hear Dr. Popchak answer? <laughs> <laughs> so it's like a long column. We're doing, we're doing another version of More to Life, and, but the list was impressive. Topping the list are concerns that I think we all have, not just Catholic families and moms, um, but I think everyone's starting to realize is a big crisis coming on, and that's the effect of pornography on the w- mental well-being of our young people and our not-so-young people. What does porn do to somebody's ability to connect in a healthy way with other people, with their family or with their colleagues? What have you seen in, in helping people cut that addiction? You know, it, it, well, it, it seriously undermines it because it's, it's of course, easier to, uh, to, to go online and uh, give yourself the illusion of a connection with somebody than it is to actually do the work of having a real relationship with people. Um, and because, uh, because of the Internet, you know, pornography is, is you know, ever-present uh, and, and harder to avoid than ever. Um, you know, in my book, Broken Gods, Hope, Healing, and the Seven Longings of the Human Heart, I, I walk through each of the seven deadly sins and, and look at the divine longings that are hidden behind those sins. Mm. Uh, the, the divine longings that the Satan then twists, right? And so the divine longing that I suggest is, is, is hidden behind the sin of lust is the longing for communion, that, mm. that we were created to be in intimate communion with each other. Lust twists that mm-hmm. desire for communion and makes us want to use other people give us the illusion of connection um, rather than actual connection. You know, it's, it's, it's almost like uh, being able to eat all you want, but then starving to death, in mm. a sense, you know, uh, because the food we're eating has no There's calories. There's no satisfaction. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> you know, it, 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 you know, that's what pornography really is. It gives you that illusion of connection without any real communion. Um, and, and because relationship is hard. You know, that the space the relationship is hard. That makes pornography that much easier to take advantage of. And so the best thing, honestly, um, that, that the parents can do to help 
children um, resist and become resistant to pornography um, is by working to have the healthiest, most mm-hmm. intimate relationship possible in the household. The stronger that fa- the stronger attachment that families enjoy, uh, the easier it is for our for kids, for all of us to resist uh, pornography addiction. That's not to say that, that a child will never watch pornography or that a person will never see pornography or be interested in it at some point out of curiosity or whatever, but the degree to which we're at risk for being addicted to it tends to be directly related to how healthy our attachments are to others and how confident we feel in our ability to make secure attachments with other people. Uh, when when those are when those are in jeopardy, when we when we're not we don't feel confident in our ability to connect with others and work through our problems and deal with feelings and go to people and know that we'll be heard uh, and responded to, that's what tends to drive us to seek the cheap and easy connection that comes from pornography. You've done a a brilliant job in linking uh, with your work the theology of the body and uh, that kind of being the foundation for a lot of the the kind of guidance that you're giving people. Yeah. And, and it's, it's, it's kind of one of those no-brainers. Like, oh, yes, that makes total sense on how to deal with these disconnects. When you yeah. truly understand the, the beauty of the human person and appreciate it, uh, each person's dignity, you can kind of deal with some of the lies that are being promoted and, and advanced in the culture. Do you I think th- that's absolutely true. Yeah, and... and, and uh, you know, I really think that, that um, you know, unfortunately in a lot of people's minds, the theology of the body is, is, is just about marriage and sexuality uh, or about um, chastity. And it certainly is about that. Um, but, but on an even deeper level, it's really the foundation, I think, of the universal call to holiness. Because, mm-hmm. you know, it, we, in the Second Vatican Council, talked about how it wasn't just priests and religious who were called to be holy, everybody was called to be holy, right? And Pope John Paul, as the first pope in, in, uh, after Vatican II, I mean, Pope John Paul I lived a month, right? So he was effectively the first pope whose entire pontificate was in the second, uh, after the Second Vatican Council. He, he wanted to lay out a framework for, for a spirituality that would be relevant to everybody. And everybody has a body. Right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and when we prayerfully reflect on the meaning of our bodies, what we, what we discover is that God created us to, to give ourselves to others, to work for the good of each other, to build each other up, to be in communion with each other. And, and using that as a starting point, then, you know, we kind of build our work out from that to talk about you know, how, how do we do that in healthy, godly ways to create those communities of love that the theology of the body talks about. Because that's really what building the kingdom of God is all about. You know, we, we have a tendency to think that building the kingdom of God is all about doing big things for Jesus. You know? mm-hmm. but, but really what it's about is, is, is working to do whatever we can to heal the damage that sin has done to our relationships with God and each other. Well, and to bring as many souls as possible to heaven along with us, right? It's a communal effort if we're successful. We're not just well, that's right, but, but the way we do that is by, is by working to heal the damage mm-hmm. that's done to our relationships. Because Absolutely. the closer we draw in that, that communion, that's how, that's how we're able to accompany people on that journey to heaven. These days, people in, in the Western world, in our world, we live better than people have ever lived before. We have less illness, we live longer, we, we have anesthesia, <laughs> we, have, we, have all, you know, we have stocked refrigerators, no famines. And yet we suffer unprecedented levels of anxiety and stress and uh, neuroses, really, I guess you'd call them. Um, yeah. So why do you think that in now, when, when things should be easy for humanity, we seem to be suffering more? Uh, well, because, again, that, that breakdown of connection that I was talking about at the top of the show, mm-hmm. you know, where, yeah, you know, in order to feel healthy, um, especially in order to feel peace, you know, to be resistant to anxiety, we need to maintain a strong connection to God, to the support of others, and to our a sense of our best self. Um, what tends to happen in today's world is that because we're so busy, because families are fractured, because we spend so much time uh, online instead of connecting with real people, um, we end up feeling disconnected from God, disconnected from the love and support of the people around us, and disconnected from our best selves. And so when that happens, uh, we do experience stress and anxiety because we're not meant to be alone. You know, if you think about, you talk about the theology of the body, a big part of, the, of TOB is reflecting on the book of Genesis and, and how, what does the book of mm-hmm. Genesis teach us about God's original intentions for us 
uh, versus what happened after sin entered the world. So before sin entered the world, you know, Adam and Eve were, were completely you know, naked and vulnerable and, and unashamed and unafraid, right? Because they were in complete union with God, they were in complete union with each other, and complete union with creation. They were in connection with all of that. After, after sin enters the world, though, what's the first thing that happens? It's the first panic attack. <laughs> right? They, 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 they suddenly realize... They run to hide. Ah! Yeah, they run to hide. Where's the fig leaf? Right? Because they're, they're naked, they're ashamed, yeah. they're terrified. They see that they're completely vulnerable. The universe is huge, and, and there's no one to protect them, right? So they, they feel alienated from God, from each other, and, fr- and from their best selves at that point. And that's what happens to us, you know, in little ways, where we experience that... The more we experience that disconnect from God, from the love and support of others, and from our best selves, the more anxious and stressed we feel. And no wonder that children, young people these days, have very high suicide rates, suicide attempt rates, uh, because maybe they're more susceptible even than adults with this new online culture and an online existence and disconnected from families that have broken down. Yeah, that's absolutely true. And, you know, um, children today are exhibiting, uh, normal, quote-unquote, children today are exhibiting the levels of anxiety that you used to only see in a, in a childhood psychiatric population in the 1950s, 60s. Oh. Um, and it's just getting worse. Uh, and, 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 you know, the, the break, you know, it's funny, it, you could talk about the breakdown of families, we immediately think of divorced families, but the reality is even intact families mm-hmm. don't spend any time together. Um, even Catholic families have lost any sense of what it means to be family. Uh, we, we've kind of redefined family as a collection of individuals living under the same roof and sharing a data plan. <laughs> you know, and and, uh, and that's about as, as far as it goes. You know, and, and we, you know, it's, it's a funny line, but it's it's really true. You know, it is it, true. It, even a generation or two ago, people recognized that family life was an activity, and we prioritized mm-hmm. it. You know, and we we scheduled sports and extracurricular activities and other stuff around family time. Now we try to squeeze in family time around sports and everything else as we can, and that means that we get maybe fifteen minutes a week with each other. Uh, that feeds the disconnection, that feeds the stress, that feeds the anxiety, that feeds the alienation, which feeds depression. Absolutely. It's now 38 minutes past the hour, and you're listening to Conversations with Consequences, featuring members of the Catholic Association. I'm Andrea Pachati bayer alongside my dear friend, Dr. Gracie Christie, and we're here with the ever-famous Dr. Greg Pawczak, and we're we're just scratching. <laughs> well, incredible. For my ego. I'm no, keep you're serious. Yeah, we'll just keep having you on. <laughs> good for your psycho- we have a very long psychological list of days. <laughs> um, and we're just yeah, starting good to. For my mental health. Yeah. We're yeah, building people up. We're all about community. Um, yeah. And we're we're just scratching the surface. And this is definitely one of those just scratching the scur- surfaces. Um, but in my long list of questions, I have um, a question that. Sometimes we talk about people being a, a difficult person or them having a bad character where they may have uh, be suffering from a mental illness or, or even have a personality disorder. What can be done to help people that are struggling with a personality disorder where it's not just a lack of virtue but something that's really kind of ingrained? How, how can we help them? Yeah, so, so the best way I can describe a personality disorder is that it's some very serious uh, core beliefs about, how, about who I am and how the world works that are just, just deeply ingrained, usually within the first five years of life, that kind of color everything I do. I, I like to use this metaphor. I mean, if you imagine somebody having a, a, a vision disorder that caused them to look at, at blue and see that it was pink, right? So every time they look at the sky, they would swear that it was pink because they saw it as pink. How would they behave, right? They would insist that the sky was pink, and they would call you crazy for saying that it was blue, and they would, they would, they would argue with you until the cows came home that it was actually mm-hmm. pink instead of blue. And what would it take to convince that person that the sky was actually blue? You'd kind of have to sit down with, with all the people that know them and say, look, I know what you see, but it's actually blue, and you're going to have to pretend that it is <laughs> if you want to yeah. get along with the rest of us. Yeah. Uh, and that's really what it's like to have a personality disorder. You see the world in a very idiosyncratic distorted way that just seems so true to you that you'll, you know, go to the grave just uh, d- d- believing that this is the way it is and fighting with anybody who, who says differently. It really takes the people around them having the courage to say, look, I know how you see this and I understand where you're coming from, but this is not the way normal people think and act and feel, and, and we're going to need you to, uh, to accept these boundaries in order to learn how to be healthy. Personality, dealing with personality disorders is all about boundaries. 
Mm -hmm. uh, because that person will, will, will work very hard to make the world in their image. And so the people around them who love them need to set very clear boundaries that say, you know, we love you too much to let you do those things that are destructive to you and to us and, and the people around you. And so even when you kick and scream and pout and tantrum and fuss and fight and feud, and, you know, uh, you're still going to have to do these things because we love you and these are healthy things to do. And that's a really hard thing for, for, for the people around a person with a personality disorder to do. But if we love somebody, that's what we have to do, because mm -hmm. loving somebody means working for their good, even when it's hard. When you treat someone for mental illness, whatever it is, whether it's personality disorder or anything else, you really have to treat the whole family, don't you, Dr. Greg? We, that's our preference, yes. Um, you know, there, there are sort of different approaches to that, but, but uh, again, because of our uh, orientation in the theology of the body, we really see every person as part of a community. Uh, and so as much as possible, we try to bring those other members of that community in the process when we're working with somebody and then see that person at, at the very least, even if we can't bring those other people in, in, in the context of their relationships, because it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to, uh, to quote, unquote, help a person get healthy, but then destroy all their relationships in the process. <laughs> Do you think that happens in regular clinical psychology sometimes, that the person, because I, I, this seems to me like this, yeah. anecdotally yeah, from, my, <laughs> from my experience, people will go see a psychologist to help them with their own personal anxiety, depression, whatever their, their problem is. And then what happens is all their relationships yeah. get wrecked because they start to... Well, they this see is what their I've relationships as threats, right? Yeah. And, 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 no, and, and they start self. to say... They start to defend themselves very vigorously against any intrusion from the outside. And they're saying, no, this is the way I'm, I'm supposed to be happy today. You know, yeah. like, stay away. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that's, you know, that, that's, that was certainly a, a, a real problem with the whole kind of person-centered approach to therapy where, you know, kind of you are the uh, captain of your own destiny kind of thing. And, and uh, you know, whatever makes you happy is good. And whatever makes you sad is bad. And, you know, it, 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 it's a very narrow focus that, that sees a person as an individual rather than a communion of person. Uh, and, I, and I think that it can actually cause even bigger problems because, like I said, if you, 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 you put a quote, help a person get healthy at the expense of all their relationships mm -hmm. and then the person is isolated. And that mm -hmm. just sets them up for bigger problems down the road. So, yeah, that, that's, that's a big part of what we do is trying to make sure that whatever changes we help a person make are also ordered to helping their relationships become healthier as well. Dr. Greg, we're going to be coming towards the end of our conversation, and I don't want to leave it on like a terribly sad note, but I was wondering if... <laughs> but... <laughs> but uh, it, I was wondering what's the role... There's mental illness, and there's giving people the tools that they need to, to address that. We also know that the enemy is prowling about, seeking the ruin of souls. And many of the ways that the, the devil gets at people is in breaking their relationships, in breaking their community, and in also confusing them on their own understanding of themselves and their own kind of infinite worth and dignity and beauty before God. What's the the interplay between kind of either suggestion or temptation of the devil, and like you mentioned, the the seven deadly sins and illness? How can we understand so, so, that? Sort of how does how does how do uh, sort of psychology and spirituality can they come together in this yeah. whole kind of equation? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that it's hard to draw distinct lines, but one of the ways that that we kind of look at it um, is that. You know, every, well, as I was saying earlier, we, we talk about Ignatian principles of spiritual discernment, right, or discernment of spirits, and, and every thought that passes through our heads, um, you know, either nudges us toward uh, being closer to God and, and closer to our best selves, or in some way it pulls us away from God, or pulls us away from being our best selves. And so, you know, we talk about, in, in our counseling, we talk about uh, healthy cognitions and cognitive distortions, which kind of play into that, but also, at the same time, we recognize that, that some of those thoughts are actually temptations from the enemy, as St. Ignatius would put it, uh, and that those thoughts that cause us to feel powerless, isolated, self-pitying, self-indulgence, those, those are not gifts and fruits of the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. right? And so by recognizing that my, you know, my head is just filled with these thoughts that are leading to a sense of powerlessness and isolation and self-pity and self-indulgence, you know, I'm not, I might be praying to God, oh, God, help me, God, help me, God, help me, but I'm listening yeah. to the counsel of the devil, yeah. right? And so I'm, I'm inadvertently removing myself from the grace that God is pouring out on me because I'm not listening to him. I'm not listening to his Holy Spirit. And so challenging myself to kind of check those voices and, and tune in instead to the voices that are 
pushing me not toward powerlessness, isolation, self-pity, but rather meaningfulness, intimacy, and virtue. Mm -hmm. you know, using my gifts and talents to make a difference in the lives of those around me. Uh, working to make my relationships stronger. Working to use whatever life is throwing at me as an opportunity to become a stronger, healthier, godlier person. You know, that's meaningfulness, intimacy, and virtue. And those are the promptings of the Holy Spirit. So t you know, teaching yourself, uh, as St. Paul says in Second Corinthians, to, to hold every thought captive in obedience to Christ. Dr. Greg, uh, parents who have children with mental illness are especially challenged, I think, in holding a line with them that's, uh, that's uh, firm and disciplined and at the same time sympathetic to their needs. Do you work with parents like that? We do. We do. And, and, the, and the, the challenge for them, um, you know, it's, it's the same challenge that every parent faces, only more so. Um, when, a, when a child is dealing with emotional problems, mental health issues, what that really means is that that child has a hard time with self-regulation, that their, their emotional brain floods their higher brain, their logical brain, much more easily than the average kid does. And so they need extra help from mom and dad in, in, in helping them to, to take down that emotional temperature uh, and get back online so that they can think through things instead of reacting to things. Mm -hmm. uh, and so when we work with parents, yeah, we, that's what we try to help them do. Thank you so much, Dr. Greg. It's um, hard to believe, but we've come to the end of our segment. Oh, my gosh, I still have so much on my list. I know. We have too many questions. We're going to have to sign up as your clients. <laughs> well, we'd lo I'd love to come back any time. So these guys are great. Thank you, Thank Doctor. You. Tell us, please, how can people learn? What is your website that people can learn more about, about your pastoral counseling? Sure. Check us out at catholiccounselors.com to learn more about all of our books and the Pastoral Solutions Institute telephone counseling practice. Again, that's catholiccounselors.com. And what about your radio show? When is that on? When is that Every day, 10 a.m. Eastern, 9 Central on You're a machine. Radio. It's amazing that you do that, that every amazing. day. <laughs> we, have, we have so much respect for you. <laughs> <laughs> We're exhausted. It's only weekly. No, it's, it's, it, I've, I've listened to a few of the shows. They're wonderful. They're really Thank incredible. You. you and your wife are our special gift to the church and, and to the, the country. Well, we love to do it. We're grateful to EWTN for the opportunity. Well, keep up the good work. And now, as is customary, Father Roger Landry offers us a short and inspiring homily to prepare us for this Sunday's Gospel. This is Father Roger Landry, and it's a joy to have a chance to ponder with you the consequential conversation God wants to have with us tomorrow on the third Sunday of Lent. The Church has its focus on the life-changing conversation Jesus has with the Samaritan woman at a well. Jesus the Good Shepherd promised that he would leave all of his other sheep behind and go in search of whatever sheep of his was lost. In the scene with the Samaritan woman, we see him putting that truth into action. She was the Liz Taylor of her day, who had married five times already and was then living with a sixth man who wasn't her husband. Her behavior had led her to being ostracized, as was shown by her going alone to draw water at the well at high noon, at the height of the piercing sun, when no one else, for obvious reasons, would have been there. Had she gone at cooler times in the morning or late afternoon, she would have met the other women and been the butt of criticism for her past and her present. Jesus went to the well at noon to await her. In his conversation with her, not only did he break two social conventions, that Jews never spoke to Samaritans and that men never spoke to women alone in public places, but most importantly, Jesus taught her and through her us about two essential realities in the spiritual life. God's grace, symbolized by the living water Jesus describes, and our desire or thirst for that living water. Upon the cross, you remember, Jesus said, I thirst. And his whole life was an insatiable quest to give us that spring of living water gushing up within us to eternal life. Just like our body cannot exist without water. The human body is, in fact, 72% water. Neither can our soul survive without living water. Jesus, through whom both our body and soul were created, knows both of these realities and came as the divine physician to give us the soul-sustaining remedy just like he did to the woman at the well. What is this living water? It's nothing short of God's divine life, what we call in theology the indwelling of the Blessed Trinity. In one place in the gospel, Jesus identifies the living water as the presence of the Holy Spirit. In the other, he identifies it with his own presence through the Holy Eucharist. Jesus wants to give us this living water of the Holy Spirit. He wants to give us his life-giving flesh and blood. He wants to have God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit come and dwell within us. 
But his will isn't enough. He placed a condition on his own omnipotence. He won't force us to drink that water. He can lead us, stubborn horses, to it. But we have to choose to drink. He wants us to desire and freely ask for it. We see this very clearly in the invitation to the woman at the well. If you knew the gift of God and who was saying to you, give me a drink, Jesus said to her, you would ask him and he would give you living water. And the woman used her freedom to say, sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty. In the same way as God thirsts for us, we must have a thirst for him. We talk about this in Psalm 63. When we pray, oh God, you are my God, for you I long, for you my soul is thirsting. My body pines for you like a dry, weary land without water. That's what God wants to help us to say to him. My soul pines for you. Give me that water. If we really mean those words, if we thirst for God, certain behaviors follow. We'll pray as much and as well as we can. We'll get to know him much better in sacred scripture. We'll make the sacrifice to cross the deserts of human life to adore him in the oasis of a chapel and receive him in the Eucharist as often as we possibly can. If we thirst for God, we will seek to quench his thirst in those from whom he says, I was thirsty and he gave me drink. Many of us, however, will honestly admit that we don't really thirst for God like we ought to. Like a man in the desert thirsts for a drop of water. Rather than having hearts out of which flow rivers of living water, our hearts can be stony, stubborn, and lifeless. But God can strike those hearts so that the rivers of Christ's love can flow. Our spiritual life is like a family that gets a company to come drill a well in their yard. Often they need to burrow through layers of rock and various geological formations to tap that underground stream or aquifer. But that's only the beginning. They need to keep the, that well free of leaves, of debris, of various contaminants. Then they need to pipe that water into their house. Finally, they have to use the water to give life to their daily activities. It's the same way with our souls. God drills the well in baptism. but We need to keep that well free of the toxins of sin and the debris that can clutter it up. We have to pump that living water into every part of our life. Then we need to bathe in that water and use it to water the various gardens of activity that characterize our life. Lent is a time for us to examine that water system and help us to take advantage of the gift of Jesus. It's the season to help us allow the water to flow unimpeded through prayer, through fasting, which helps us to clean the pipes of spiritual rust through almsgiving, in which we pour out in pitchers the living water of Jesus to others. Lent is a time in which, like the Samaritan woman, we leave our jug behind, are filled with living water, and begin to irrigate the world. In the last book of the Bible, in which Jesus speaks to us from within the heavenly Jerusalem, he reiterates what he said to the Samaritan woman. It is done, he said. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give as a gift water from the spring of the water of life. He will give it to us, if only we thirst for it. He tells us in the Beatitudes, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for holiness. To thirst for sanctity is to thirst for God. Jesus promised that those who so thirst shall be satisfied. And he's faithful to his promises. This Sunday, let us respond to Jesus' invitation, pine for him, and say, Give us that living water always. Praise be Jesus Christ. And we hope you'll catch us next week as we venture further into conversations with consequences. Catch us every Saturday at 5 p.m. on your EWTN local affiliate or on Sirius Channel 130 or check us out at thecatholicassociation.org slash podcast.